Welcome everybody to DSLR Fast Start. My name is John Gringo and in this class we're going to be talking about the Canon 60D. This is a new camera from Canon. It's just been out for a very short period of time. It is aimed, I would say, primarily for the intermediate level photographer, but it is certainly capable of professional quality results because it has a lot of manual controls and a lot of great features on it. It's got a lot of automatic and simple modes for the beginner uh, photography. But like any instrument, if you don't know how to use it, you're not going to get the best results out of it. And so this class is all about learning what the camera can do and how to do it and how best to set it up. So let's go ahead and get started. So give you an overview of what's going to be going on in this class. Uh, first off, we're going to be looking at the product, looking at Canon, some of the lenses, and just kind of what you've got yourself into by getting a Canon 60D. Uh, after that, it's uh, something that kind of necessary we need to do, and that is we need to talk a little bit about some photography basics. There's uh, a lot of photography in the camera, obviously, um, and some people who get this camera don't know a lot about photography and would probably be well served taking a photography class. Uh, this class is particularly on working this camera, not on photography in general, but we'll talk about that as we go along. We're going to go through the camera, basically starting on the outside, exploring all the buttons and what they do. And then we're going to go to the menu system, the inside of the camera and all the software that's in it and see how to set up the camera and all of its various functions. We're then going to go through some camera operations and this is where we set the camera, practice setting the camera up for a variety of situations, um, portrait, landscape and things like that. And then finally, we'll end the day by looking at some lenses and accessories that you can get for this camera that I think uh, are probably more notable than the rest. So, when you get this camera, you're going to get yourself an instruction manual. It's got uh, over 300 pages, and if you spend a couple minutes per page, which is quite easily to do, uh, you're going to spend about 11 hours uh, reading this instruction manual. Now the class that we have today is going to last about four hours, which means that we're going to try to do this in one third the time it takes to read the instruction manual. Um, obviously we're not going to be able to include everything that is in the instruction manual. I've had to uh, kind of edit and uh, make things a little bit more consolidated and concentrate mostly on what most people want to do. And so from time to time I will refer to the instruction manual for more information for things that we just don't have time to cover in this class here. As I mentioned before, this is not a photography 101 class. If you are not familiar with shutter speeds, depth of field, things like that, there may be uh, some terminology that we use that you're not familiar with. And if you have not taken a photography class and you've just gotten this camera, it's great that you're here uh, because now you can learn all about your camera, but you will need to learn more about photography to really master the camera. And so that is a separate class and we will talk about some of those basics in the second part of this class. So let's talk about kind of the product overview, generally what you've gotten yourself into by purchasing a Canon 60D. First off, it's a Canon camera. Uh, Canon is a Japanese company that specializes in optical products. They make cameras, professional quality videos, they make amateur uh, lens or lenses and cameras, point and shoot cameras for instance. They have a lot of different office products, and that's where a big part of their company is. And they also make their own circuitry within the camera, so the circuit boards, the CCD sensors, the CMOS sensors that are in the cameras themselves, they actually make those themselves, so they are a very large company. Just a real brief history on them. They started in 1933. Their first camera was a rangefinder camera. Things didn't really get going until the late 50s when they introduced their first SLR, a Canon Flex. And we'll talk about more about what an SLR is coming up in a moment. Their first professional camera was the F1 from 1971. And then in 1987, a rather big change happened, and that is that they changed the lens mount on their camera. And this is real important to anyone who wants to buy older lenses. You want to make sure it's not part of the old FD system. They have a new EF system. We'll talk more about lenses at the end of the day. But they made a big change, and they changed their bodies and lenses to a whole new system to accommodate autofocus. And that's what a lot of our 
systems on the camera are now based on in that change from 87. In 2000, they had their first digital camera. It was the D30. And I remember that pretty clearly because it was $3,000 and 3 megapixels. And you compare what uh, you're getting in this camera at 18 megapixels for uh, around $1,000. Uh, this would be an amazing camera to take back in time to that, to that point to show what cameras were going to be like. Now, the uh, Canon cameras that are offered uh, are a full range of cameras from very, very much amateur level to top of the line professional cameras. And this camera, the 60D, fits pretty much in the middle of it. Uh, something that definitely any amateur would probably like to have and even some professionals might like to have as a backup camera. It has some nice features that are not on other cameras. One of the great things about getting a Canon camera is, of course, all the lenses that you get to choose from. There's over 50 different lenses uh, that are just about going to do anything that you can imagine. Super wide angle, telephoto, fast lenses, big zooms, all sorts of lenses. And then finally, rounding out the system, they have a very good flash system. They have a number of flashes, macro flashes, on-camera flashes to shoot weddings and so forth with. Uh, they have a very good flash system that you can add on to it. So it's a camera that you can customize to the way you want to work. Now the 60D is kind of position and heritage. First off, it's got a couple of cameras below it, the Rebel series, and it's got several models above it. Uh, 7D, 5D Mark II, and then the 1D Professional series. The 60D came out in 2010, very late, really didn't become readily available until mostly until two, 2011. And it is based pretty closely off of preceding cameras, the 50D, 40D, and so forth, all the way back to the D30. So as you can see, it's about the eighth in a generation uh, in, a, in a long line of lens, or excuse me, it's about eighth in a long line of cameras uh, that have been coming from Canon. And this is where they started. The D30 was their first digital SLR, and this is a direct descendant of it, if you will. So next up, we're going to go through a box opening. We're going to go ahead and open this box right here in front of me. But um, there's a list of items that you're going to get in there. And let's go ahead and open up this box and see what we got inside. So when you buy the box new, uh, this is a kit package. It's got the 60D and it's got the 18 to 135 lens. Starting with, you're going to get some warranty cards, which lets you know that you have got an official product from Canon and it's not uh, a knockoff of some sort. Uh, there'll be a package of information that includes software, and this is for downloading the raw images and some image browsers. It's not completely necessary depending on the other software you have. Personally, I like to use Lightroom, and a lot of other photographers like to use that program too. And if you do, you're not going to need this software. So it depends on whether you have that or any other software that you like to use. The instruction manual is in here, and as I say, for anyone who's new to Canon or new to this camera, it's good... Uh, advice to keep that around because there's all sorts of bits of information in there that uh, you may want to know at some point. As we dig in here, let's, uh, let's pull out the camera first. Nicely wrapped in bubble wrap and then of course another little clean cloth here. And so here's our camera, nice new camera. I'll set this down right here in front for the moment. Uh, inside you're also going to get some things like a camera strap which is a nice camera strap. It's got the big old Canon logo on it, which some people love and some people detest. Uh, we have some cables to hook it up to a TV. If you want to do a slideshow on your TV, you can hook your camera directly up to an HD TV, for instance. This is actually uh, cables for a traditional TV, but we have uh, cables for, oh, do we not? Oh, we don't. Um, this is the USB cable for downloading the images if you want to download directly from the camera. Personally, I prefer a card reader. I'll mention that later in the accessory section. We have a battery charger and a battery. We will need the battery to charge, to power the camera up for today. So I'm going to go ahead and open this. And hopefully we have enough charge on this battery to make it work. So I think this is a new battery. Set that aside. And then in here, the all-important lens. And so this is the kit lens as this package is supplied. You can also buy this body alone. This is the 18 to 135. It's a good basic zoom lens to get started with. Set that right there. And then we'll go ahead and put this aside and start putting together our toys. So we got our camera, our lens. 
Let's go ahead and mount the lens up. And on this camera, we'll talk more about this, but there is a mounting index, a little white square right there. And on the lens, you can see there is also a white square. So we're just going to match those up like that. Turn until we hear a click, and it is properly in there. Next up, we're going to go ahead and put the battery in. On the bottom of the camera, there's a little latch. Drops in, locks in place like that. The camera is not sold with a memory card, and it uses an SD memory card, which we're going to go ahead and mount right in the side like that. And our camera is turned on, and we're going to be ready to go here. So. That's what you get in the box, and uh, if you buy the body only, you're going to get everything just like that with the exception of the lens. So, care and handling of the camera. Let's talk about this for just a moment. Uh, when you get the camera, there, it comes with an instruction manual, and it's got all sorts of warnings in there about things you should or should not do. And it's going to say things like, don't get it too hot, don't get it too cold, don't drop it, don't get it wet, don't take it apart, don't leave it by a giant magnet. Don't store it with corrosive chemicals. Don't store it with highly radioactive material. I might have made that one up. I'm not sure. Don't fire the flash at someone driving a car. Don't use around flammable gas. Don't swallow the battery. And in essence, don't be stupid with it. Um, and we kind of all get that. I mean, we, we know that it seems ridiculous that they even include that in the warnings. But the ones that people do ask about is the camera is not waterproof. Do not get it wet. What does that really mean? Uh, because everybody wants to be able to take the camera out into a light rain or they want to know is it going to dissolve if I get a couple drops of my Starbucks coffee on it. Um, well, the camera is not weather sealed and that's one of the things that uh, is true of some of the professional end cameras. They have weather sealing around all the openings. There's a, a lot of openings on the camera. If you think about every button on the camera is a potential place where water could seep in, get into an electronics board and ruin the camera. So conceivably, one drop of water in the wrong place could ruin the camera. However, that rarely ever happens. The types of cameras that get ruined by water are people that drop them in a swimming pool or a river or a lake and people who stay out in the rain far too long with their camera. How long is too long? Well, it depends a little bit on the rain, but if it was a light, misty rain, I don't see a problem going out there for 10 minutes and shooting pictures. Or if you're out there taking pictures, you know, keeping the camera under cover, whether it's a roof or an umbrella or your raincoat, and then taking the camera out to take some pictures uh, when you really wanted to get that shot, that would be appropriate use of it. Uh, as I say, it's, it's not a waterproof camera, but if it was raining, I wouldn't be shy about going out there and very carefully using it uh, and then trying to dry it off as quick as possible. If you are out shooting and it gets wet and it stops working, uh, it might come back to life. And the way you can help it come back to life is by opening up the camera and letting things air out. So for instance, you can take the lens off, you can take the battery out, you can open up the memory card door, and you can basically let the camera sit there and breathe like this. You don't want to take a hot air uh, blower, hair, hair dryer or something and blow it on it. Just let it sit in a warm, dry environment like this, and there is a pretty good chance that it will come back to life once it has dried out. If it hasn't, it'll need to go to Canon repair services and need to be fixed, and that could end up costing you several hundred dollars uh, if they can fix it, which they most likely can. It's just a matter of money. The other little warning that you get with this camera is that Canon is not liable for damage if used with non-Canon accessories. There's a lot of different things that you can hook up to this camera. We have different lenses, flashes, memory cards, batteries, and then when we get into the side door here, there's a whole bunch of different plug-in cables that you can get from remotes, USB cords, and so forth. Canon does not want to be held liable for damage to your camera if you hook up something crazy to it. In general, I haven't seen any cameras get damaged in that way, but there are some features that you may not be able to take advantage of if you have an aftermarket accessory put on. Uh, one of the areas I would strongly recommend Canon accessories is in the flash department. The communication between the body and the lens is fairly sophisticated, and Canon does a really good job at that. 
So I'd probably stick with a Canon flash. For lenses, Canon makes a lot of great lenses, but there are some other manufacturers that make good lenses as well. And there may be some features, and I'll mention these as we go along, that may not be able to be communicated back and forth between the body and the lens. Uh, and there are some other accessories that you can hook up. Generally, you're not going to damage the camera. You may not get all the features and benefits of what the camera can do. Was there any questions that you kind of had popping up on some of those warning things there, Susan? I had a question. Sure. Um, I want to know about this giant magnet. Yeah, well, you know, a memory find, card. Where would you find a giant magnet? A speaker. And just a, like a stereo a, speaker? A stereo speaker. Really? has large magnets in it, depending on where they're located. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, you go to the local bar, shoot their concert, you may not want to store your memory cards on top of the speaker. Wow. But so that's, it's not so much the camera, it's more the memory card. So don't put your camera on top of a speaker either? I probably wouldn't, no. If there's a memory card in there. Yeah. Okay, we know. Where, we else, know. where else would we find a giant magnet? I'm just curious. Um, that's probably the biggest one that most speaker. people are going to, to be around. I, you know, I wanted to see if going through the airport security, because you go through the metal detector there, and so I took a memory card through the metal detector to see if it would have any problems, and that's not a big enough magnet. Okay. So that's not a problem. So, and the, through, going to the airport is not a problem with any Going through the x-rays is no longer a problem. I okay. Mean, luckily, digital cameras came around just at the right time. And it, it, that was a big problem with film getting x-rayed. But you can have your camera x-rayed, and that's not a problem. The okay. same thing with the memory cards. Awesome. Good to know. It's a good little tip there. That is a good tip, because I'm yeah. always paranoid. Yeah. No, x-rays are not a problem on your camera. Okay. Awesome. Thank Tweet you, Tweet that. Tweet it. That's a good one. That's a good tip. <laughs> x-rays are not a problem. Yeah. All right, next up, I want to talk about preparing the camera for shooting. Uh, first thing you want to do is you want to charge the battery, and that's going to take about two and a half hours. In general, you're going to get somewhere around 1,000 to 1,600 shots on it. It depends greatly on how much you use live view, how much you're reviewing images, how much you use stabilization, how much you use the built-in flash. So your mileage may vary, but around 1,000 to 1,600 shots. We've already attached the lens, showed you how to do that. We've installed the battery, which is good. We've put the memory card in. Let's go ahead and turn the camera on. We turn the camera on right back here. Flipped it on. We're good there. And this may be the last time I say this, but uh, for, for those of you following along, go ahead and put your camera in the green auto mode on the, with the mode button in the top left. That's that green box. And what we're going to do here is we're going to press the shutter release and take a picture just to make sure our camera is working. Camera focuses, flash pops up, and we've got a picture. Let's see, make sure we got our picture here. Yep, got a picture of our students. All right, to get to know how to work this camera better, you also have to have some knowledge about photography. And so we're going to talk about some photography basics here. Now, unfortunately, this is not a class in photography. It's not Photography 101. We don't have time to go into all the elements of photography. But if you would like to get into it here at Creative Live, we do have a class called Fundamentals of Digital Photography with somebody by the name of John Gringo. Um, and it's a 10-week class, and if you want to learn about photography, it's a good way to do it. There's more than 20 hours of instruction from everything from exposure to focal length to composition. And if you want to learn more about how to use this camera, uh, that is going to be a great follow-up course to this 60D class. But just to give everyone a little preview of what's in the class, or just a few basics, if you've never taken a photography class before, let's talk about what a digital single lens reflex camera is. Because that is what a 60D is. So on this camera, it has one main lens, which allows in a lot of light. Now, there are many different lenses. There are wide angle lenses and there are telephoto lenses. And so there's a variety of lenses that you can get with it. The supplied lens has a little bit of wide angle and a little bit of telephoto. When the camera focuses, lens elements will move back and forth, refocusing the subjects onto the image sensor. And within that lens is an aperture, which is a doorway that kind of opens and closes. It's more like a hallway. It's never completely closed. It's just a matter of how wide open it is. And this opening and closing allows you to control the amount of light coming in the lens. And so on this example here, we have a lens that starts at 1.4 and closes down to f22. And with each step of the aperture, we let in 
half as much light as before. And as we go back opening, we're getting to smaller numbers. We're letting in twice as much light with every step of the way. Now, this is a little bit confusing because a small number is a big opening and a big number is a small opening. So some people are often confused by that, uh, but it is something that you need to learn about. And so let's look at a picture example of a lens shot at 1.4. And so here we've photographed just a simple yardstick, the number seven, and the two little red hash marks on the right indicate what is in focus, the, the front of the focus and the back focus. And you can see with each change of the aperture, we get a little bit more depth of field. It's not a huge change, it's a subtle and small change, but they add up over the course of changing this aperture into being a quite significantly different photograph by having more and more depth of field. And so this lens can close down to f22. Some lenses can close down even further. And here we go to f22, which is as much depth of field as we can get out of this example. And you can see that there's a big difference between the f1.4 and f22. Now, going back to the camera and that light that enters through the lens, the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to hit a mirror. And this is the reflex part about single lens reflex. It bounces the light upwards into a ground glass. And some of you may remember using a twin lens reflex or a waist level finder where you would view directly the ground glass with both eyes. And that was the way a lot of cameras were. But it's uh, been a little bit easier for photographers to view a camera, view scenes through a prism system and a tradition or a new viewfinder. It allows you to see exactly what the lens sees, whether you have a telephoto or wide angle lens, or whether you're using any sort of filter, you get to see exactly what the lens sees. Now, when you press the shutter release, the mirror needs to get up and out of the way so that the light can travel back to the image sensor. Uh, if you had a film camera, this is where the film would be. Now, this image sensor is really important. It's the heart and soul of the camera, and we're going to talk more about image sensors and their size in just a moment, because the size of the sensor is very important as well. Now, in front of the sensor, before the light gets there, there is a shutter unit. It is a curtain that opens and closes for a particular amount of time, and it is a two-part unit. It has a first curtain that opens and allows light into the sensor for its particular length of time, and then a second curtain will come down and close it. And these curtains are typically uh, three, four, or five blades of titanium or very light aluminum so they can move very, very quickly. And then the mirror returns down, allowing you to see back through the viewfinder. And so while you are taking pictures, you cannot actually see what you're shooting. It's for that very quick moment, you don't get to see exactly what you're shooting. Now these shutter speeds are really important because they can be used for a variety of situations. So a very fast shutter speed, like 2,000th of a second, will stop a bird in flight. A 500th of a second is a good one for shooting human action. So if you're shooting sporting events, 500th is probably the lowest shutter speed you would want to use. Getting to a more moderate shutter speed, 125th of a second for something that's not moving too fast, in this case, some camels walking in the desert, it's a suitable shutter speed. But for animals moving very quickly, horse race, a 30th of a second is going to give you a blurry shot. Not that blur is bad. Blur can be bad, but this is often what is considered to be a good blur. So now we're getting down into much slower shutter speeds. Here at an eighth of a second, you can see some people walking casually and how much they are blurred at one eighth of a second. You can see that the bridge that they're on is actually sharp because I used a tripod in this shot, allowing the people to be blurred as they are moving. If you like to shoot waterfalls or water moving, you're going to want a slow shutter speed. This is at a half second, and that water, there was a wave that crashed over this rock, and then the water was flowing over it, which is causing that look to it, a half second exposure. This camera can shoot down to a 30 second exposure, and so these uh, might look like clouds around mountaintops, but they are actually waves crashing in on a rocky shoreline. And so a 30 second exposure, it's a uh, mostly nighttime out there at this point, a little bit of moonlight illuminating the water. So these long shutter speeds can be a lot of fun to do because you're not exactly sure what you're going to get when you set it up. Now we said we were going to talk a bit more about the image sensor and this is where we're going to do it. 
when you walk into the camera store and you look at all those cameras behind the shelves, what may not be apparent is that the image sensor that is in these cameras is of a different size. And let's talk about the different sizes that are available because whether it's a single lens reflex or one of the smaller point and shoots, there's a large variety of sizes available. And that size of the sensor is really important to the way lenses look and to the types of pictures that you can get and expect out of these cameras. Of the cameras, uh, for single lens reflex cameras, there are three common sizes up there. And if you recall 35 millimeter film, which was a big standard in photography for a long period of time, well, it had a height and width of 24 millimeters by 36 millimeters. And this was what we used for quite some time. There are some digital sensors that have exactly that size sensor, and we call those full frame sensors. Uh, and we call them full frame because they're the same size as the 35 millimeter sensor. And it has what we call a crop factor of 1.0 which basically means it's the same size as 35 millimeter. These are great sensors. They're very high resolution. They're very good in low light. I kind of wish all cameras had them. Uh, the problem with them is that they're pretty expensive to make. And so the camera manufacturers started making smaller sensors because they could make cameras more affordable. So Nikon has a sensor out there that they call their DX sensor. And it uh, has a crop factor of 1.5. Now the camera that we're talking about today, the 60D, has an APS-C sensor. It has a 1.6 crop factor to it, and it's just a smidgen smaller than the Nikon DX sensor. And so this will be important when we choose lenses, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to the lens and accessory section. So this was all basically a little bit of a cut from my class called Fundamentals of Digital Photography. If this uh, did not fully explain everything about photography to you, you may want to take a look at the class. Uh, you, it's a downloadable class. You can get it right here at creativelive.com. Take just a moment here and see if there's any questions before we get started on the next section. I just want to give you a couple of comments. There are definitely are people in the chat room on Twitter who have uh, watched your course before. Oh, good. And, uh, they're, they are saying how great it is. And Dr. Blind, want to give him a shout out, said that, that slide in particular, it's the best SLR and f-stop description animation I've seen. Good job, John. Tell him, won't you? Oh, thank you very much. So, Appreciate that. Yeah, so another um, just uh, amazing animations that you'll get in your well, fundamental One of the class. things when I teach photography, I'm, I'm a very visual person. I think photographers are visual, and so I create my own graphics and animations to help explain how things work. Hours and hours and hours. Far too many hours, <laughs> but to your benefit. Right. Also, just to say about the fundamentals class, um, advanced students are kind of wondering if there's anything in there for them. And we were just saying, you know, it spans from beginners to advanced students, and you're going to learn something new mm -hmm. from that class no matter. I mean, I've, you agree? I've, I've had professional photographers take sit in on my beginning class and walk out saying, I learned some stuff I did not know about. And so, uh, you know, unless you're a full-time professional who's been doing this for a long time, there's probably a bunch of things in there uh, that, we, that we get into. I mean, we, we talk about mirror lockup, we talk about hyperfocal distances, uh, a lot of composition. We spent two weeks on composition. And so there's a, there's a little bit for everybody. So it's a good learning course and you can learn at your own pace. I agree. <laughs> 